Good morning and welcome to you all. I'm Robin Alders, a Senior Consulting Fellow with the Global Health Program at Chatham House, which is a partner organisation with the Poultry One Health Poultry Hub. This is the 17th and sadly the final panel in our uh, roadmap series, which has been a fabulous series looking at um, the future of poultry, people and planet. We want to thank you for joining our fortnightly discussions that have addressed key issues for sustainable development from the perspective of nutrition security and the global poultry industry. We're aiming to contribute to the UN call that we build back better after the COVID-19 pandemic for the future we want. And just before we get underway, a couple of housekeeping notes. Today's discussion will last for one hour. The event is being recorded and will be available on the One Health Poultry Hub website and a direct link is going to be sent to you. Do please put your questions to the panel through the Zoom Q&A function, which you can access at the bottom of your screens. Feel free to vote for questions that you think particularly important. And if English is not your first language, it doesn't matter. Simply submit your question. And uh, it, what, we do, what we want is to hear from you. I'm going to put as many of your questions as possible to the panelists, but if we run out of time and we don't have a, a chance to present your question, I, I'd like to apologize in advance. We have an online discussion channel that you can access from the website and from your reg registration link. Please explore this to share questions, comments, and thoughts. These online discussions will contribute to a series of briefing notes that we'll be preparing at the conclusion of this series. Today's discussion is on a really important topic, One Health Food Systems Governance. I'm going to ask our panelists what are the key elements of a One Health food system and what are the next steps to achieve this transformation? Before we go on with that, um, we're going to have our first poll. Uh, we're very keen to find out what you're thinking. So in this first poll, we're asking your opinion. One Health food system's governance should focus on, and then you've got uh, five, health, five options there for you to choose. As soon as you've uh, voted, that poll will disappear from your screen. So while you do that, I'm delighted uh, to welcome our expert panels for this uh, final discussion. Dr. Namakulu Kovic and Namakulu and, and Alan, if you'd like to put your videos on. Namakulu is a nutrition scientist and senior research coordinator with the International Food Policy Research Institute based in Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia, currently in South Africa at the moment, but her, her uh, formal position is in Ethiopia, and part of the UN Food Systems Summit Action Track Leadership Team. And uh, Professor Alan Dangor, who's just cycled into his office at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, who is also, he's also a former specialist advisor to the UK Parliament Environmental Audit Committee uh, inquiry on planetary health. Dr. Kovic, Professor Dangor, you each have 10 minutes to present your thoughts. We'll give you a signal at nine minutes and then you'll have one minute to wrap up. So with no further ado, it's over to you, Dr. Kovic. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. Um, so I will be talking about One Health uh, um, governance in terms of uh, key elements that I think should be considered. Um, for this, I have actually uh, tried to look at, I'm struggling to move my slides. Okay. For this, I will look first at trying to define what governance for One Health um, should be, specifically with an eye on, on the poultry industry. And I'm defining it as a collection of policy mechanisms um, processes and related stakeholder relationships through which an agreed common One Health vision can be realized and improved upon in a sustained manner. I also am borrowing some text from the articulated goals of this series. There was an indication that one of the goals is to develop a one uh, health roadmap that seeks a, a destination where economic, social, and environmental sustainability 
and justice are key indicators of success. So based on this, the common One Health vision I am putting forward to you today is a world and countries with a functioning One Health system that promotes optimal health, economic, social, and environmental sustainability and justice for all. I refer to optimal health because we need to be improving as the situation uh, evolves. This slide is from the, the, the Lasset uh, report of 2019 that looked at uh, how we were doing as a planetary population on uh, the health and, and planetary boundaries. And poultry was identified as one of the optimal uh, foods that can be uh, consumed from a planetary perspective. And the arrow there in blue is pointing at where Sub-Saharan Africa is in terms of consumption of patterns, which points to uh, some saying, yes, great market, now we can produce more. And so indeed, we are seeing African countries uh, beginning to intensify uh, food production, uh, moving from mono, from a very diverse production systems to monoculture, because we have to do that. Because not only do we need to feed more of the population that is growing on the continent, we also must feed the poultry that we now want to produce more of. And then looking at poultry, as we intensify, we are beginning to see uh, use or increased use of micro microbials and pesticides. And for the crop production, we are seeing fertilizer and pesticide use increasing. In both cases, both in crop production and um, livestock production using poultry now as an example, we are losing diversity as we are intensifying our production processes. But at the same time, we are also adding things like uh, residues to our food basket. And so One Health is necessary for both aspects of intensification. Of course, we have all been rattled by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has really demonstrated uh, why we need a, a One Health uh, approach. And the lessons that have been learned, we need to see how do we actually translate this into doing better? Uh, how can One Health approach, for example, help in preparedness uh, for the next pandemic? The pandemic has affected the entire globe. And so it really demonstrates the need for One Health. And in fact, uh, even our close friends like dogs and what if you have not been spared. And the question is, have we done any further damage uh, elsewhere uh, in our uh, ecology? Meanwhile, we continue to destroy our environment and sometimes indeed on purpose by setting fires so that we can um, expand our agricultural lands. Um, and so environmental health must also become part of our One Health governance uh, process. Not only have we encroached on uh, the environment and the wild, we've also brought the wild to us through farming and hunting. And I give an example here of mink farming in Europe where indeed with the COVID pandemic, again, we've seen how that uh, has panned out with millions uh, of mink being destroyed, uh, being buried, and then subsequently resurfacing because of the accumulating gases in having such massive numbers of animals um, um, buried. Indeed, again, it demonstrates the need for a One Health approach to everything that we do. And so for our government mechanisms, we require policies that are actually holistic, um, that also provide adequate resourcing for implementation with equity considerations. Um, and this includes both in terms of provision of food, but also in the types of trades that we engage in for food systems. So it's not just production, but at trade as well, we need to think about One Health and what the implications for One Health uh, are.
And so guidelines, rules, and laws are important as instruments, uh, and they are important to also help us I think in terms of what we need to monitor uh, in terms of progress, but also in terms of preparedness, because we have to be in a state of alertness uh, as we move forward. That then is associated with accountability mechanisms that are required right from community through to global level, because after all, we are on one planet. So what happens in one country will affect what happens uh, elsewhere. So this common vision that we then come up with needs to be uh, supported by policy instruments to uh, look at the effective ge governance mechanisms that are, are holistic. Um, in terms of key messages that I want to leave with you, I want to look at the UN Food Systems Summit that is ongoing now, uh, the preparations that this is really has opened important policy windows that must be leveraged for a common vision. If we lose this um, opening, it, it will actually be sad because multiple countries are engaged. And so we have an ability to do something in several countries uh, simultaneously. Then the one health governance, as I indicated, need to be holistic and must cover everything uh, from plant, animal, human, environment, and planetary health, because the interlinkages are very critical to inform the types of actions that are needed if we are to really sustain one health. And then, of course, we should not ignore existing policy instruments in low and middle income countries and elsewhere from which we can actually build momentum. Uh, thank you very much. And over back to you, Robin. Thanks so much, Namakulu. That was a fabulous uh, introduction to the various elements of, of One Health. I'd like to, um, whoops, we have one question that's come in here. Ah, and I see that's one on uh, vaccines, not necessarily um, for you, Namakulu. So I'd like to ask you, um, let me just think what I want to ask you. I'd like to, um, to ask you if there are countries thinking of One Health as an area of effort in, in Africa. Ah, and in fact, uh, that's Dr. Uden, who was just going to ask that question. It's just come up there. Fabulous. Um, indeed, uh, there have been efforts in, in terms of different African countries uh, putting in place policy instruments. I know, for example, um, Nigeria launched a One Health strategic plan uh, in, in 2019, which was to be implemented actually from 2018 to 2023. So the launch was late. Kenya and Ethiopia also have uh, One Health strategies. Other countries are doing the same. And in fact, the African Union also has um, a, a strategy on One Health. So countries are indeed, even in Africa, thinking about One Health. The challenges are on the implementation, which is one of the reasons why I indicated that adequate resourcing for implementation of strategies is critical because it's not so much that countries are not thinking about it, but the resources to actually make things work are not there. Thank you and over back to you. Thanks very much, Namakulu. So um, you, you've now got a few minutes to think about uh, Mike's question about vaccines. I realize it does relate particularly to your point around uh, antimicrobials and residues. So you can think about that if we can. Um, Dan, if you'd like to just pop up the poll question, we'll just see what people are thinking. Really interesting that uh, no one thought that the One Health approach was, was not appropriate for food systems, so that's great. And 88% thought that really we need to cover all of these, ensuring the production of safe food, um, including reducing the risk of zoonotic disease, delivering safe, nutritious food in ways that doesn't harm the environment and sustainable food systems for humans and domestic and wild animals and plants. So that's, I think, um, yes, we have a, an excellent community just waiting to listen to you, Alan. So over to you, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, uh, Namakulu, for, for your excellent uh, uh, talk. 
Uh, that was incredibly helpful. Um, and to, just to that vote, um, I, I'm, I'm going to, I think, hopefully make the case that uh, the One Health approach is incredibly important, but uh, needs to be expanded uh, uh, to understand uh, planetary health, climate change, and planetary health more 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 formally, and I've I've rather uh, uh, grandly uh, called this talk planetary government governance. Uh, I didn't quite know what else to call it, but I'm trying to bring in these ideas of climate change and planetary health, um, and hopefully uh, that will become clear as I speak. Um, the uh, uh, we have the, a food system uh, that at the moment uh, is really rather remarkable in the fact that it delivers food for more than 7 billion people. Uh, but of course, uh, it, is, uh, it is challenged uh, in, the, in the nature of the food it delivers and the distribution of the food, the quality and quantity of that food. And, uh, and that uh, leads to problems of course, uh, and we talk often about these multiple burdens of malnutrition, and I use malnutrition in the sense of malnutrition in all its forms, which includes both undernutrition and overweight and obesity and other uh, nutritional deficiencies. Uh, uh, and, uh, and you can see from this map from the Global Nutrition Report 2020, uh, that uh, in many countries around the world, uh, we are experiencing multiple forms of uh, malnutrition simultaneously. Um, and, uh, and this is, of course, a result of a food system that is delivering the wrong forms of food to the wrong people. Uh, you can, uh, uh, and poor nutrition is associated with 11 million deaths per annum. Uh, 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 which is frankly a, a really shocking figure. Uh, but the food system, uh, which, which, is, which is, as I say, remarkable in its ability to deliver food for, 11, uh, for 7 billion people, uh, uh, doesn't do it enormously well in many parts of the world, uh, but is now under unbelievable pressure, additional pressures. And those, of course, those pressures, of course, come from, uh, from climate change, um, and the projected climate change. Uh, and, I've, and I've thrown up here a couple of maps and, and some figures just to talk, just to, just to really understand the scale of what's projected to happen. Uh, so on the left there, we have uh, changes in global average surface temperature between now and 2100 under different scenarios. And these are called representative concentration pathways. Uh, the red line uh, represented it at RCP 8.5. Uh, is the line which, you know, there is quibbling about whether we should use 8.5 or something else, but basically it's the line which says uh, we're going to do nothing about climate change, nothing about our emissions, nothing about the amount of CO2 we put into the atmosphere, and that will lead on average to a four degrees rise in temperature uh, globally, on average. Uh, the blue line is the line which is we're going to try everything we possibly can to remove carbon dioxide, to remove our emissions, to reduce our emissions and to you know, take emissions out of the, out of the atmosphere. Uh, and that will lead still to a rise in at least one degrees, temp one degrees uh, centigrade by the end of the century on average. But of course, the distribution of the temperature change is uh, very uh, uh, varied across the globe. Uh, the sea, you know, the land warms up more than the seas, and, and you can see, of course, that uh, if you look at the graphs on the right, the top two, the maps on the right, the top two are temperature and the bottom two are precipitation, uh, that the, the, the projected changes uh, are really horrific. Uh, so in, if, if we follow the RCP 8.5 route, which is the we don't do anything about climate change route, uh, you can see that some parts of the world will be 10 or 11 degrees hotter. Uh, there will be no ice on the, on the North Pole or the South Pole. Um, and we're going to be in unbelievable amounts of trouble in Africa, in Asia, in America, in Australia, uh, where Robin currently is. Uh, so these are uh, uh, really horrible graphs. Uh, and of course, you know, our interest today, I mean, these are horrible graphs in many ways, but uh, uh, our interest today is what is the impact of that on the food system and on the availability and affordability of foods. And uh, there have been uh, <clears throat> some work previously by uh, published in the World Bank in a development report in 2010, and this work has all been updated, but this is a particularly helpful graph, uh, which looks at the impacts of projected climate change on the yields of cereals, uh, the, the, the map on the left, and you can see that these are, uh, I think it was 12 different major cereal crops uh, are all uh, massive declines in, in, in yields uh, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, in Australia uh, uh, by 2050. 
uh, uh, increases in yields in Northern America, Northern Europe, and, you know, Northern Asia, uh, but uh, sub substantial declines in yields in cereals. Uh, we've subsequently uh, uh, published two systematic reviews looking at the, all of the available evidence on the impact of environmental changes, whether it's water or temperature or ozone or salinity, uh, on the yields of vegetables and legumes and on the, on the yields of fruits, nuts and seeds. Uh, and the vegetable and legume data is very clear. Uh, and I was very interested to see Namakulu's graph showing that, uh, that uh, uh, in Africa, uh, seven, uh, Africans eat uh, huge amounts of starchy vegetables. And, you know, that, remember the big chunk on the right, 729% uh, uh, of, their, of their, you know, above the planetary boundary, which is good because of plenty of starchy vegetables. But uh, under, under projected climate change, that the yields of those starchy vegetables and legumes is going to decline substantially. Uh, with reduced water availability, raised temperature, increased ozone, and increased salinity. Uh, and the evidence on fruits, nuts, and seeds is much less abundant, but still suggests that there will be declines under these significant environmental changes. So we have, therefore, a food system which is delivering food, not quite the right food to the right people, uh, but is now going to face this enormous challenge of climate change. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there are real questions about how it's going to cope with that. Uh, and if you look at our food system, you know, from the farm to the processing plant, to the warehouse, to the, to the shop, to, the, to, the, you know, to your kitchen, to your mouth and to your bin, uh, of course, you know, there are different routes to go from the farm to your mouth, uh, but that's an example. At every step, of course, there are substantial environmental impacts. Uh, so this food system uh, is having uh, an enormous impact on the environment, whether it's emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or water use, or biodiversity loss, or soil degradation, all of these things uh, are, are important uh, and need to be tackled. So that's why it's so important that we link up uh, sectors. So I'm a nutritionist, and in the past, nutritionists have cared about foods and diets and their impacts on health. And whether that's through nutrients or you know beyond that to the safety of food or the contaminants in food, much of poultry hub work, of course, uh, uh, related to that. Uh, uh, but that's not enough anymore. We cannot limit ourselves to working in that tiny space. It's of course it's very important, but we must expand uh, uh, our, our work and think much more about the food system. Where does the food come from? that makes up our diets and has an impact on our health. And of course, then, as I've just been saying, of course, we must then link it up with the environment. The food system has an impact on the environment. And as we've seen, the environment will have an unbelievable impact on the ability of the food system to deliver foods and diets. So only by looking across the linking up those sectors, the environment, food system, and health, can we really uh, uh, tackle these major issues? And if you do that, you can see the potential impacts and plan for, for the future impacts. You can also build resilience within systems. Uh, and then of course, uh, of course, all of our ultimate aim is to protect population health, people, uh, and, and, and look after our planet. So just to end with some concerns, uh, when we're talking about systems, so food systems work within these environmental boundaries, and Amakula mentioned them as well. So if you just look at one part of the system or one system, the food system, without looking at the environmental system, then your solution is not going to be sufficient. We must do this in combination. When we talk about resilience, uh, the, the change in, 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 the avail in yield, global yields of foods, all types of foods will lead to changes in prices and global availability of food, and uh, especially in low and middle income countries. And therefore, what are the implications for what we are going to eat? So what's the implication for our diets? How are our diets going to change in the future? Uh, and then specifically to poultry, of course, you know, what are poultry, what, what are chickens going to eat? Where, where, where is the feed going to come from? And is there still going to be demand uh, uh, for poultry in the future? You will all be aware, of course, that there are enormous technological advances uh, in the production of alternative forms of meats and, dairy and, and, and other animal source foods. So there's a real question, and this is a, a, a very real question, especially in, in many uh, uh, high-income societies, about how much longer uh, we're going to eat animal foods. 
uh, as opposed to alternative forms of animal foods. Uh, and there's a huge investment, as you will, will all know, in this. Uh, it's a booming sector, uh, the alternative meat and, and milk sector. And, uh, and there are significant projections that within 10 years, uh, we're going to see an entirely different food system uh, relating, relating to animal source foods. Of course, uh, this is going to lead to unbelievable disruption uh, among farmers and farming communities and societies. And so there's a, a, obviously a real need to think much more clearly about transition and supporting and just transitions. How do we support farmers uh, towards greener alternative, you know, uh, 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 build back better futures? And then finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit very briefly about transformation. We are incredibly uh, good at uh, thinking about the future uh, based on what we've learned in the past. And that leads to uh, nudges, that leads to tiny little incremental changes. Because, oh, well, it didn't quite work that well last time, let's just do it slightly differently next time. So there's incremental changes, that's what we do, we're very good at that. We're much less good at vision. We're much less good at imagining a different future, having the inspiration and the vision to plan for an entirely different future. And these things are you know, typically cathedral projects. So cathedrals, the, the cathedral in Barcelona, uh, imagined by Gaudi in early in 1850s or something, uh, still unfinished. Uh, uh, for many reasons, but you know, had the vision to say, let's build something enormous. I know it's not going to be finished by the, but by the time I'm dead, but it's what we need. And I think we really need, when we think about, uh, you know, governing a food system, governing uh, a, a system which is which which will enable humans and and the planet to live uh, into the future healthily. Uh, we need to think about really big visions uh, and deliver those. Uh, uh, for, for everybody's sake. All right, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alan. That was really a, a wonderful, even if somewhat scary overview of why we all need to be part of the transformation of our global food system. Um, we've got some great questions coming in, but I'd like to just uh, use my privilege here as moderator to, to ask you how you think the UK government uh, is progressing and the UK as a country in, in relation to food systems transformation at the national level. Uh, thanks very much. That's a great question. Very timely, of course, because uh, the uh, uh, Henry Dimbleby uh, uh, has just published the, the plan, as it's called, which is the main part of the national food strategy It's the, uh, in the UK. It's the first time uh, we've had a food strategy in the UK for more than 75 years. Uh, it's a really exciting moment. And it's the first time that we've brought together uh, uh, food production, uh, population health, and environmental sustainability. And uh, the, the, the plan itself uh, contains 16 different recommendations that come under four different headings. Uh, that the first heading is escape the junk food cycle and protect the NHS. The second heading is reduce diet related inequality. The third is make the best use of our land. And the fourth is create a long term shift in our food culture. So there are so what's exciting about the report is that it's really the first time, as I say, in 75 years that there has been this effort to link up these sectors, uh, food system, uh, population health and the environment. What's less exciting about the report is, of course, uh, it's not nearly ambitious enough. Uh, it's not nearly transformational enough. Uh, but I, I, and it contains endless, endless recommendations that we should nudge people. Uh, nudging just is not going to work. Uh, we need to change faster than the climate is changing and nudging isn't going to get us there. So uh, I would like the government to be much, or this, the government now has to read this report and respond and is, is committed to, to a white paper uh, coming out of this, uh, the National Food Strategy. Uh, I would imagine it will be uh, watered down even further through the white paper process. Uh, and I find that very disappointing, but at least we have a document from which we can work. Thanks so much, Alan, and, and uh, well done to the UK for getting that, that, that report through. Um, not all of us live in countries where we've, we've progressed as far, so it's great to see it there, and we will be watching with interest as to how the government does respond. Um, Namakulu, I am going to have to go back and ask you this question that, um, that Mike asked initially, 
um, because it's a very popular one. What do you think? And, and Mike Francis is a, an eminent virologist and vaccinologist, and he's really keen to see what role you think uh, vaccines are going to play in, uh, particularly in relation to food safety. Thank you, Robin and, and Michael for the question. Um, answering as a non-virologist, um, my answer is the fact that I think yes, vaccines would definitely help. Um, but I think in addition to that, we need to look at the issue uh, quite holistically, holistically. So while vaccines can help, we also need to think in terms of perhaps stocking practices to look at what we might also need to be able to do uh, differently to have better health outcomes. Because what forces us to use antimicrobials is simply the fact that at the stocking levels that we use in the poultry industry, if you crowd that many uh, birds in one place, you're gonna have disease problems in terms of transmission. And so we forced to use antimicrobials. Um, vaccines, I don't think can help all disease outbreaks. So there will be other diseases for which uh, vaccines might not be helpful. And so, we need to still take a, a holistic look at, at what needs to be done. And I like Alan's take on us being visionary. So yes, let's think vaccines, but let's also be visionary in terms of what could we perhaps do better uh, so that we can be have better outcome even with vaccines. Thank you and, and over to you. Thanks very much, Namakula. We're going to let democracy rule at the moment. And I'm going, we've got two questions that have been voted up very quickly. So I'm going to put both the questions and then I'm going to ask Alan and then Namakulu for you to respond to them. So the first question came in from uh, Ellie Paravani and she's saying as advocates and campaigners, what can we do to ensure that resourcing is made available in countries with One Health plans and strategies? And following on from that and linked to Ellie's question, Barbara Hasler is asking or stating, there is a clear case for One Health or planetary health and integrated governance, but they require additional efforts and resources, which are difficult to find in a resource scarce environment, such as now for most of us in most countries, who should, who can fund these integrated approaches to health? So over to you first, Alan. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, I suppose, you know, for me, uh, it's a question of ambition. Uh, we have, you know, it's it, the impacts of uh, environmental changes on population health uh, are projected to be enormous. Uh, if you imagine the direct impacts of heat, uh, the, the increased an increase of extreme events, uh, flooding and droughts, the uh, and then the these uh, uh, um, um, environmentally mediated effects such as uh, uh, vector-borne disease spreads, uh, undernutrition, uh, changes in the food system, and then the socially mediated effects such as uh, migration, uh, conflict, uh, and other things that are projected to happen. Uh, within a relatively short time frame. Uh, we've already, I mean, last week, there was a report here in the Met Office making it very clear that the extreme events, the extreme weather that we're experiencing in the UK could not have happened without anthropogenic climate change. So uh, we are seeing this already. This is very clearly happening. It is happening uh, all around the world. Many countries are already struggling uh, with significant changes in their weather patterns, long-term changes. Uh, so we can sit here and watch it. We can sit here and, uh, and talk about it. Um, and, and we can say, oh, well, we're quite interested in what we're doing, but that all sounds a little bit complicated. Or we can be a bit more ambitious. We can, we, we can ask our governments to take this much more seriously. We can, we can advocate for significant resources to be pushed towards uh, the impacts of climate change and health. We can support governments around the world who require support uh, to understand the impacts 
to understand the, the benefits of mitigation and to plan for uh, adaptation approaches as they, uh, 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 and interventions as they will be needed. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, this, is the, this is the greatest crisis of our time. And if we just sit and say, oh, there isn't money to do anything about it, we will have lost before we've started. Uh, we need to be much more clear in our messaging. We need to be much stronger. We need to be less concerned about uh, uh, our, our academic futures and actually concerned about our futures. <laughs> uh, 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 we are, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm increasingly passionate about this in case you can't tell, uh, but I've also just spent a weekend with uh, 100 young people uh, in a, in a, a, at a festival, the Youth for Food Festival, in, in, uh, in, in just outside Bristol, which was an incredibly inspirational uh, uh, event uh, with a hundred young people who are asking and demanding and are part of national youth governments uh, 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 to, to demanding change. And, 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 you know, that provides me with inspiration as well. When you see people who are 14, 15 uh, years old, really passionate about the food system and the environment and their health, uh, then, 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 then I think that's a very exciting moment that we should all capitalize on. Thanks, Alan. Um, Namakulu, what are your thoughts in response to Ili and Barbara? Yeah, I, I think we have two, three things that have, um, that are happening simultaneously that hopefully can help us. Um, first, touching on what Alan has said, I don't think we really have the luxury to be wondering about where the money is going to come from. I think our governments must prioritize uh, One Health as a matter of survival uh, for our planet, for us as humanity. I mean, if, if COVID is an example of what might come, we don't really have time to think about where's the money going to come from. So my view is that governments must prioritize budgets for One Health specifically, um, and that they must uh, put in place governance mechanisms for that to make sure that it can actually happen. I also think that all the philanthropic organization and whatever you, they get their money from business from people. And this is an area that if they do not spend in, even their own livelihoods might not exist as well as they could otherwise. And so it's in everybody's uh, benefit to actually do something. So the three things that are, I think are terrible but working for us um, well is that we've got a UN Food System Summit ongoing at process, multiple countries engaged at the same time. In that uh, perspective from a, a food systems transformation process, One Health has come up as an area that requires um, action. And so you have these multiple policy windows that have opened at the same time simultaneously across the, 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 the globe. Then we are all experiencing this mega COVID-19 pandemic that you can point to, to say, look at what can happen if we don't do anything. Um, and then of course, the catastrophic floods that we have just had in Europe and all the fires that are going on in North America, all happening at the same time, we've got things we can point at and we've got a, a policy process that is going on simultaneously across the board. The advocacy people for, prioritization of budgets, I don't think there's going to be a better time than now. Thank you. Thank you. I do hope that you're both right. And thank you very much for encouraging us to get on and do something. In that light, uh, Nitish, um, uh, Prof Nitish from Bangladesh has a really um, important question here. And he's saying or asking, are current global food trade systems favorable for transforming the food system. Uh, Alan, would you like to go first? Good question. 
Yeah, really, really good question. Uh, food trade is so interesting and so important. I mean, give, let me give an example of work that we've just published. Uh, uh, I'll put the paper in the chat. Um, we uh, looked to, to we looked at our own food system here in the UK, and we looked to see where we get our fruit and vegetables. Um, and it turns out that somewhere between sixty and seventy percent of those fruit and vegetables that are consumed in the UK are imported. Uh, so we're only producing 30 to 40% of the fruit and vegetables that we eat in the UK. Um, and that's fine. But then we look to see where we're importing from and we look to see what's the climate resilience of those countries. And uh, 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 half of the food, the fruit and vegetable that we import comes from countries that are severely climate vulnerable. So that's doing two things. Number one, it is destroying the environments of those countries so that I can eat strawberries in January, which is a silly thing to be doing. Uh, and number two, it is of course, a significant risk to the UK food system. So uh, as those countries are no longer able to provide the foods, uh, fruits and vegetables, where are we getting them from? So the market system, the trade systems and, the, and, and global capitalism has enabled us to trade food in the way we currently do and source it from the cheapest places. Uh, and to hell with the impacts, to hell with the impacts on the environment. And who cares about UK farmers if they, you know, if they if they can't be bothered, if they can't produce fruit and vegetable cheaper than someone else, then then we don't care about them. That has clearly got to change. That is clearly a system which will not deliver health and sustainability and a future for people. And that's just the UK. So you can imagine the trade. Uh, in other countries, we've also recently published a, a fascinating paper on, on inter, sorry, intra-state trade. Uh, so, no, in, sorry, trade between states in India. Uh, so we've shown that there's a huge amount of trade of cereals between states in India. And the states that export the most rice to other states in India are the states with the least water, the greatest risk of, 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 of droughts, you know, uh, uh, you know, the most vulnerable, climate vulnerable states. So again, a real issue about where are we growing food? Uh, and, and, you know, it, it really builds on that question about, you know, transforming a food system to, to, to face a future which is totally different from where we are now. Thanks, Alan. Namakulu, your thoughts are in relation to trade and food systems? Well, I, I don't think um, the global trade necessarily is um, favorable for, for transformation of food systems because it has been, to start with, it has, from a food uh, perspective, it has been so biased towards um, staple food movements across the planet. Uh, in, in terms of Africa, for example, what the world has been trading in is what we have been producing. So, so we've, we've left uh, what we would normally have been producing, uh, things like sorghums and millets, we have ignored completely. Um, and we've produced maize, maize, and more maize, even in places that are not suitable for maize production, because our trade system seem to be geared to be able to support that. Um, farmers invariable will actually produce things that they have markets for, that they have help with, and that kind of stuff. So our whole, putting an African lens on it, our extension systems have been geared towards uh, staple food production, for example. When we look at, even if you looked at poultry, for example, if you look at Zambia, we can't move, we can move po ingredients for poultry feeds out of the country more easily than we can within the country. And, and so uh, if, we, if we produce soybean, which we do and export quite a bit of, we can get it to the ports uh, for exit out of the country, but we can't move it within the country to other places where, let's say, if you were to produce poultry there, you can actually have the poultry feed that you require. So the trade system that is in place now is definitely not working. 
Um, and, and it needs to be looked at. And, and when we are thinking in terms of, of one health, I, I really like Alan's view of, it's, it should be very, the whole planet. Um, so what are the one health implications of the current trade system? Those are questions that we need to, to grapple with and we, we have to address. Otherwise, the idea of building back better will be building back better for the past and not the future that is facing us. Thank you and over Thank you, fabulous. You. Thanks, fabulous answer, Namapulu. Uh, uh, our time is, is not really on our side, so I'm just going to ask each of you individual questions now. And I'm just, once again, use, going to use my prerogative and I'm going to jump down and ask a question from Dr. Uh, Nadaraja, and sorry if I mispronounced your name. Who, uh, who says, is enough being done in educating for systems thinking in the various professions? After delving in this arena of tertiary education for three decades, I don't feel confident that enough is being done. Much nudging, not enough transforming curricula. Alan. Yes, of course. I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, that's exactly right. But we don't, we don't. You know, academics don't do this. We are world experts in tiny, tiny, tiny little things, typically. And we're really good at that. And that's how we become professors, because we really know an awful lot about something very small. Uh, uh, we really need to uh, be much better at knowing more about more things, uh, you know, and linking up and, and you know, and, and having diversity in teams. And, uh, and, and you know, it's... it's I, I'm very, very fortunate to work with a team here that includes soil scientists, vets, nutritionists, epidemiologists, modelers, all sorts of mathematical statisticians, all sorts of different people uh, with diverse training and diverse backgrounds. And it's so exciting, uh, but it's quite unusual. Uh, it's happened uh, by chance rather than design, uh, lately more design, but uh, it's really exciting. Uh, um, and only then do you get these perspectives. Do you get, well, we don't, do, in my discipline, we don't do it like that. We do it like this. And have you thought about this? And have you thought about these unintended consequences over there? And only by having that diversity of voices in the room uh, who come from a different, from diverse, from, from different disciplines and different backgrounds do you get that. And I couldn't agree with you more uh, 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 that, uh, you know, more on systems understanding systems and the interlinkages of systems is critical. Uh, we should be training, doing much more training in that space. Thanks very much, Alan. And uh, Mike Francis, he's been voted up. Normally I don't ask a second question from the same person, but he's got such a high vote. I don't have a choice. So Namakulu, Mike is asking, changing food systems will be dependent on people changing their eating habits. How can we influence this? Oh, wow. That, I think that is the trillion dollar question at the moment. Um, so I think one of the things that we, we have failed to do is get people to think in terms of their own health even, uh, ne never mind the planet. Um, consumption patterns that are detrimental to our health even when we know what the potential impact of what we are eating is, we still love the food and we're gonna eat it. Um, and so I think what we need to do better is actually learn from those that advertise those foods um, that are detrimental to health and, and actually see how they manage to get us to want to eat things that we know are not good for us. Um, and that element from a, a consumption perspective, I don't think we've done enough of. Um, we've complained uh, to the private sector about them giving us unhealthy food and what have you and stuff like that, but we haven't looked to them as a potential um, area of solution to see how they are influencing our decisions 
and actually use that to say, how can we turn this around to actually begin to influence consumption patterns for the better? And that is an area that I think is missing uh, in the way in which we have done things. The other thing is looking at our food environments, the way in which they are structured and how that actually leads to the types of choices that we then make. Again, it's an area that needs a lot of work. It's not gonna be just people talking, uh, the regulatory environment has to get on board as well. There's no reason why you walk into a supermarket and if you see your, your sweets and stuff, they're not really designed even for the parent to buy. They are at eye level of the toddlers so they can cry and scream and then you can buy for them. So there are a lot of other things that we really need to do that would be useful, but we, we have to work with the private sector, learn from them in terms of what they are doing and how we can do differently. Finally, I think a lot of countries have put in place food-based dietary guidelines, which I think personally we have misused. Um, in that we've produced food-based dietary guidelines and given them to the consumers and expect them to make choices. And then the rest of the food system is doing what they been doing uh, for eons. So those food-based dietary guidelines actually have got nothing to work with. I think food-based dietary guidelines should not only target consumers, they should target all food systems actors. They should become guidelines for how everybody could contribute to better consumption patterns, and they can be used to align all our efforts towards um, this very difficult uh, perspective of changing consumption patterns. Thank you. Could I just add, Thanks. Robin, do you mind? Uh, I put something- Yes, in, please. I had to put something in the chat there, this report from Rethink X. So I just think that uh, if you don't know about it already, it's an absolutely fascinating report. Uh, which suggests, uh, and the reason I put it in to answer to this specific question is that there is so much change underway in the food system at the moment, and especially in this, in this space of animal source foods, which is where there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, and companies are flooding in, in uh, innovations are flooding in, you know, investments are definitely, if you read the Financial Times every day, there's a piece about another company that's been set up uh, to produce uh, an alternative proteins. Uh, and it's really quite astonishing. So, you know, there is, you know, nudging people to change their diets and all that, that's possibly going to work. But actually the food system is, you know, parts of the food system are changing really rapidly uh, and recognizing the impacts of environmental change, recognizing the impact of the food system on the environment as well, and trying to find solutions. And you know we've just we just uh, we just submitted a paper on on transitions within the UK diets and shown that uh, even it's quite it's still at quite a low level but there's a significant increase in the consumption of alternative proteins especially amongst younger populations younger UK uh, uh, young, young, younger members of the UK uh, population so the, these are transitions that I'm sure will uh, rapidly uh, uh, accelerate. And uh, and and the and and the 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 the, uh, the industry, the food industry, is waiting to deliver a vast array of different foods for us to eat. And it's scary. It's different. And do we really need them? And do we really want them? And are they safe? And all this all this stuff is important. But there is significant change afoot. And uh, you know, there are real questions about: Are we ready for it? And do we understand it? Uh, but uh, but but uh, you know, pretend, I'm I. Personally, I'm very excited about uh, about the way the system will change in, in, in the coming years. Thanks, Alan. And, and for those of you, if you're not able to see the, the references that Alan is sharing in the chat, we will post it on Slack. So you will, you're all going to have access to those. And uh, I, I agree that food systems are changing rapidly. The food industry is changing. I also have sympathy for your farmers in the UK, Alan. Um, you have uh, farmers that have farmed land for centuries, and this is true around the world. And stewardship of land is part of and caring for the environment. So it's about doing it in a way and having an offtake that's sustainable. So there may be some industrial and some 
super scientific food products, there will also, I hope, going forward, still be a, a place for more traditional food systems that support those farming families that care for land and, and care for, for the planet and, and, and people. Now, we are, we're really running out of time, but I'm going to ask um, you both, I think, a five-word answer to a question that I think um, is, is relatively important. And that's uh, Dr. Sayaka. And once again, I probably mispronounced that. I'm sorry. But uh, the question is, would you think just improving food system is enough to feed the global population? As in, wouldn't we also need to control the human population growth, for example, through uh, education of women? If so, do you think that this is realistic? Short answer from both of you. Alan, um, please start with you. Oh, yes, go ahead, Namakulu, please. Yeah, I think just to, since you want only five words, um, I think there's need for efforts on both fronts. There are already efforts on both fronts. So, yeah, a lot of, in terms, we know, for example, in Africa that um, higher education does reduce the number of children per, per, per woman. So that is happening. And it, it, it's also, um, improves health outcomes as well, which is very relevant, I guess, to one health. Um, yeah, food systems must change, but we also need to manage our population somehow. Thank you. Thanks, Namakul. Hey, yeah, I mean, Alan, I mean five a, words. obviously a very important question, uh, uh, access to education, access to reproductive uh, services, uh, 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 delay in, in age at marriage and first child, I mean, those are human rights and they shouldn't be, it's not a discussion. Uh, and I think that we, we, you know, obviously women should have access to those things and they should be in, in, a, in a free and fair way. And uh, that's not even a discussion. And we know that when that happens, uh, fertility rates decline and that's good for everyone. Thanks, fabulous answers by both of you. It's been a wonderful discussion, um, but unfortunately we do need to wrap up we're approaching the hour. I'd like uh, our audience to please join with me in thanking our two fabulous panelists who've highlighted several uh, crucial points for us to consider. So if we can just have a look at these key takeaway messages. Namakulu reminds us that the UN Food System Summit this year and COVID-19 have opened important policy windows that must be leveraged to develop a common vision and, start, uh, and chart a pathway to synergistic actions. One Health governance mechanisms must be holistic from community to global and must consider plant, animal, human environment and planetary health. Namakula also emphasised the importance of not ignoring existing policy instruments in low and middle income countries and elsewhere from which uh, momentum can be built. Alan highlighted that the food systems work within environmental boundaries. Addressing one system while ignoring the other will not be sufficient really crucial point. Climate change will have implications for global food security. And uh, he also gifted us the three T's, technology, transition, transformation. So a fabulous uh, 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 offering there. Thanks so much to both of you. If we could have our final uh, poll up on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, we want your feedback from uh, you who have been listening and participating in this discussion. The question is to achieve effective One Health food systems governance in support of sustainable development. What do you think? And you have five options there. So while you think about those options and that uh, screen will disappear once you cast your vote, I, I really do want to thank Namakulu and Alan again. This has been a really important discussion. You've given freely of your time and your expertise as have all of our panelists. So thank you so much. Once again, our tech team has performed superbly. Uh, and uh, I really, really want to thank you, our audience, for your interest and your questions. It's your participation that has really enriched these discussions. And if you have time over the next couple of weeks, do please uh, share your thoughts uh, via our Slack channel. And uh, there you can see how you can access all of the, the uh, materials. You can see Dan's... Um, uh, word cloud there or word chicken. These are the key words that have come up through the discussion in this series. 
Um, if we could see the results of that uh, poll question now, please. Here we go. Once again, we, we see that we have to work across multiple fronts. So all three options are important. Once again, 88% voting for those three, no one thinking that they're not important. So thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thanks once again to our panelists. Please stay safe. And remember, you're now eating for our future. We're counting on you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you.